Canadians love debt. Some love it more than others, but it's certainly a trend. Drive down the busy roads and find every luxury car you can imagine. Drive through the neighborhoods and see constant massive renovations, new homes being built, and what seems to be an endless supply of wealth. Only one problem, all of it's being bought with one form of debt or another. There's no possible way that this will stop unless it collapses everything. This is going to be a bumpy ride. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we're going to have our focus on Canada. We're going to look at the debt problem that is here and that will unfortunately cause massive pain for a lot of people. Now, I always cover this same issue, just giving you the progress updates here. I always talk about the fact that Canadians use debt to buy everything. It is absolutely pervasive. When you look on any scale, it doesn't matter. This is very, very clear to me it's very evident just with what I see locally in Toronto but I've looked at the statistics I've seen them before and of course we've been covering that for years and years so let's get into the data right away Canadians are heading into the new year with a familiar resolution to tackle over levered balanced sheets and of course what they mean here is that they want to get rid of their debt. They have actually had this as their top priority for nine years in a row and it never happens. Every single year the debt gets worse. It says here in the third paragraph that their debt right now is 173.8% debt to disposable income that ratio has gotten worse and worse and worse and when you look at the cities toronto and vancouver the numbers are far worse than that when you look on a national level of course everything kind of gets spread out but toronto is over 200 percent and vancouver is approximately 250 percent these numbers are unsustainable the problem is that this is where most of the population lives this is where we have the most expensive real estate where we have the the most debt and it's only going to make this problem worse if it continues to expand and of course it will. In the bottom paragraph, we have the Bank of Canada's governor saying that prolonged extraordinary low interest rates has led to, quote, an accumulation of household debt of historic proportions. That is something that you would hear right from the money GPS, and at least we're having this acknowledged by the Bank of Canada. Now, it's very important to follow what the Bank of Canada does for people living in Canada, but also around the world, because these central banks are obviously in communication. They act in coordination with each other. But I think that what's happening with the Bank of Canada right now is that they are stalling. They are simply biding their time here. They did not increase interest rates as much as they would have hoped to. This right here shows us that the debt problem is actually getting worse. And they know that as interest rates rise, it's going to put a further burden on individuals because they are so heavily in debt. Obviously, the biggest form of debt being their mortgages. This article is talking about real estate. Canada's home sales skidded to the lowest level since 2012 last year after dropping for four straight months through December as higher interest rates and tighter lending rules cast a pall over the real estate market. Now, I think it's interesting to see what they did recently where you had the commercial banks coming out, RBC leading the charge, and they brought down their mortgage rates. And I wondered why why RBC did this. Now, obviously, the central bank hasn't acted yet, but we probably saw less and less demand coming out of RBC's mortgage department, and they didn't know what to do except to get rid of some of that spread that they have in between the central bank interest rate and the mortgage rate. That is obviously what has been done here, and it shows you the weakness that is impacting not just all of the individuals individuals buying and selling these homes, but the corporations giving out the money as well. 
at the bottom paragraph, it's interesting that they actually acknowledge there is very little chance of a major comeback in 2019 for what's going on in real estate today. I'm glad that we're seeing some acknowledgement of this. Of course, the severity of the issue is not really being presented to people, but at least we're hearing of some of this in the mainstream. Canada's hot housing cools. Annual home sales fell 11% to the lowest level since 2012. Obviously, it's still hot right now compared to, let's say, where it was decades ago, but the market is definitely cooling down here, rising interest rates to a level that is still historically abnormally and unusually low. We have the Bank of Canada's governor actually talking about the amount of debt that people are taking on today is way too high. This is a problem, but most people don't think of it like that. They just look at their monthly payments. I'll tell you right now. Now, for those who don't understand this, in Canada, the way it works is that you might have a mortgage that you intend on paying over, a, let's say, a 25, 30 year period. And what you will do is have the interest rate negotiated for generally a five year term. Five year tends to be that sweet spot where the rates are at. You don't get it for the whole term of that mortgage. It doesn't work like that. So this is what is a little bit different than other places. OK, so people need to understand the fact that if mortgages are at a certain rate today, by the time they go to refinance it, it might be a lot higher. At least that's what it was in the past five years. That's why people are pushed to the edge already. Now we've got a problem here with what's going on, not just with this article, which is about GM closing down one of their plants. Now it's important to know what's going on in the economy itself. Do we have jobs moving in or are the jobs moving out? What are the jobs that are moving in and which are the ones that are moving out and it seems like the manufacturing base is declining thoroughly it is disappearing and this trend is going on over decades it happens slowly but of course the average person is not prepared for this and never will be this is what their skill is they are in this factory here they've been doing it for 20 years suddenly the plant closes now they may have other opportunities for these workers here there might be a way to get them another job perhaps in a different location but now for example this person is let's just for those who don't live in the area one hour east of Toronto and now oh yeah we have a job for you but it's two hours west of Toronto what do you do maybe you lived in that one area now you're gonna drive two maybe even three hours to where you gotta go in rush hour every day no you're gonna uproot your whole family you're gonna move over in that area this is not exactly what some people make it seem like it's just a little bit of relocating or just a little inconvenience no big deal this is a problem we've seen it happen before because what happens in Canada is often very foolish they make these decisions that are never beneficial to corporations to allow them to employ people they're strangling everybody and they're making it very difficult every single opportunity to push down the little guy and the corporation is done here I assure you it is so difficult to run a business within Canada and there's no telling uh, you know why this is the case when you look at it for really what it is if you look around, you see nothing but luxury cars. And I'm not even talking about standard BMW and Mercedes-Benz vehicles. I'm talking about McLarens, Lamborghinis, and every other car that is the same cost as a house being driven on the streets of Toronto. You have no idea. Now, where are they getting this money? Well, I don't personally know, but what I can tell you right now is that individuals are financing their purchases of different things with their ATM but not the ATM you're probably thinking about we're talking about their homes and as you can see right here in this paragraph home equity line of credit may lead Canadians to use their homes as ATMs making it easier for them to borrow more than they can afford and I believe that last part there is so important they can't afford it, so they pull equity out of the home and buy what they want. 
Canadians are borrowing against their homes in increasing numbers and many are not making regular payments against the principal, adding financial stress to households already carrying a record level of debt. The number of households that have taken a home equity line of credit on top of their mortgage has soared nearly 40% since 2011. At a time when consumers are carrying record amounts of debt, the persistence of the home equity line of credit debt may add stress to the financial well-being of Canadian households. Obviously, I do agree with that. They don't stress it enough, but at least it is being talked about. There are about 3 million HELOC accounts in Canada with an average outstanding balance of $70,000. Imagine that. They are spending on average $70,000 to do whatever it is that they want. They didn't have that $70,000 but thought it would be wise to take it from their ATM and so the money is free. That was all part of the appreciation. It was free money so let's spend it. No, let's not save it. No, let's spend it. So there's another article along with this that I do believe is very important. Just over one quarter of Canadians with home equity lines of credit are paying only the interest portion of the loan. That is extremely dangerous, but nobody wants to talk about it. Additionally, almost three in 10 respondents use such lines of credit at least some of the time to make payments on other debt. And you wonder why the situation with bankruptcies was up until just recently declining. And I told you specifically that this was the reason. And that is now confirmed. The data is in. People take money from their home and they pay off their credit cards. That's exactly what's happening today in Canada. I'm sure it's going on in most other places around the world. Over the past 15 years, home equity line of credit has been the largest contributor to Canadian non-mortgage household debt. At the bottom, they have some point forms here. 27% of the HELOCs users reported paying only the interest portion most months. You have to understand how severe this problem has become. When you look at one quarter of the people paying only the interest, now why is that the case? Because they can't afford paying the rest of it off. They have been paying off their credit cards using this home equity line of credit. Now what happens if real estate starts to fall? We've already seen a slowdown. This is going to punish people the likes of which we have never seen before. 49% of HELOC holders said their limits were over $75,000. Many people report that they are using the money to fix up their home. Okay, They are doing renovations, they are trying to improve their household, and they take the money out of it and then put it back in in the process of renovating it with one thing or another. Some think that that's a wise idea. I personally do not because it could crush them. It's not wise to take out debt in this form. There's no reason to do it. If you can't renovate it on your own and do it little by little, just hang in there, save up some more money, and then do it at a later date. Don't take on any more risk. It is not wise under any circumstances. Further to the information that I was discussing, you can see the insolvencies climbing. Canadian consumer bankruptcies and proposals are rising from a year earlier. This is the yearly change. We're looking at this happening right now, increasing. Previous to that, we had seen a decline in bankruptcies. And this was the reason, because people were able to pay off all of their other debt using their home equity line of credit. It's genius for them. It's a lower interest rate. They can do so at any time. It's very easy. The bank will set it up for you. No problem. And it unfortunately causes a big, big problem down the road. But let's not talk about that. And last but not least, if you want the financial education that was not taught to you in school, these two books have everything that you need. You can check them out at the link in the description. If you want the audiobook version, that's available at themoneygps.com.